साथियों मैं साहिल हूँ आई एम साहिल एंड आई वर्क एट लेफ्ट वर्ड बुक्स एंड द मेडी बुक स्टोर एंड वॉट डू वी डू हियर वी मेक बुक्स वी रीड बुक्स वी टॉक अलॉट अबाउट बुक्स एंड समटाइम्स वी ऑल्सो सेल बुक्स एंड एंड दैट इज वाई बट मोर इम्पॉर्टेंटली मोर इम्पॉर्टेंट दैन एनीथिंग एल्स वी रेजिस्ट थ्रू आर बुक्स एंड बिकॉज ऑफ दैट प्रिंसिपल बिकॉज ऑफ दैट लॉजिक Uh, our resistance is reflected in all the books we have made and because we resist against everything in human against all human injustices everywhere in the world uh, we also stand in unflinching solidarity with the cause of palestine in 2014 leftward books published this title you want to talk about all these four books as well not talk just like mention them another book is hedarids decolonizing the palestinian mind it has been recently long listed in one of the most prestigious awards in africa uh, by the sunday literary times uh, this book is in actually connection with another of our book which is on palestine by edward sayed uh, hedarid is building on uh, edward sayed's work from this book and uh, you know further on taking it further and then two of our favorite books that we are very very proud of and very heavy books the freedom theater and rehearsing freedom it is about the group in palestine the freedom theater started by a freedom fighter uh, an army man a nurse and a magician to express resistance through their theater in a uh, refugee camp in jenin Uh, which was made after the big uh, well known battle of jenin in palestine and uh, this is what these books are about what we are actually trying to say through these books is that we stand in complete unflinching strong solidarity with palestine and that is why we have today organized this particular discussion uh, with professor nivedita menon and uh, prabir porkasta and now i will not waste any more of your time i will uh, hand it over to professor nivedita menon uh, who's uh, a professor at the political science department in jnu who's also i mean i don't need to really introduce about all the uh, achievements of professor nivedita menon but i want to say that uh, she is an ardent supporter and a political voice from india for the cause of palestine so thank you so much uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to um, welcome Prabir, uh, an old old friend, back from his luxurious sojourn as a guest of the government of India at our tax, pay, at, on our taxes, mind you, right? Yeah. Well, anyway, it's a pleasure and an honor, nevertheless. Uh, Leftward, of course, has published his uh, memoir, Keeping Up the Good Fight, uh, which was, uh, which when you read it, you kind of think it was begun at a time when. i assume it was begun at a time when he uh, was planning to write about his first uh, such uh, luxurious holiday under the emergency uh, to commemorate his first experience in jail but during the right of the writing of it it seems to me the government decided to give him a two for one deal right what is called making an offer you can't refuse so the book was i'm i'm laughing so that i may not shout and yell and cry i think you understand that because the injustice of it is unbelievable so that book which you should all pick up before you leave was published while he was in jail but here he is amongst us and we welcome him i would also like to take this opportunity to express uh, solidarity with the amazing platform that he created news clip as a platform as a team which has uh, it's an indomitable team which has stood up shown a spine shown many spines and have paid a heavy price most of them have paid a heavy price for brave honest and ethical journalism and of course uh, every media platform and every social media activist and every journalist who has stood up to the bullying and intimidation and the fir's and the uh, all these cases uh i i celebrate them they have continued to bring us information that we can trust today uh, prabir will speak on palestine and the ongoing uh, genocide in gaza i'll just take a few minutes to 
uh, layout issue. The, it's a lecture by Prabir actually. Um, so I was, I'm always very, I'm always reminded of a historian Carlo Ginsberg who said, in history as in cinema, every close up implies an off screen scene. So the genocide does not begin after the Hamas assault on October 7th. 2023, uh, a few days before this Prabir was arrested, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, nor, does, uh, nor does the Hamas, Hamas assault indicate the beginning of the story. The off-screen scene behind October 7th is the long flashback to 1948, to the Nakba, to the dispossession of the Palestinians from their lands, a long, brutal process that has continued over decades. Killings, torture, um, expanding uh, and violent occupation of Palestinian lands, uh, and the everyday indignity and humiliation at checkpoints. So what has changed since October, 20, October 7, 2023? Um, the, uh, there is an accelerated genocide, of course, but qualitatively, too, there has been a shift. Um, I also just want to bring up actually a few lines from uh, the Palestinian poet Muri Barghouti, who said, in this, he wrote this, these lines long ago, but this has been a continuous demand on, on us who support Palestine and on Palestinians. Uh, do you defend Hamas? Do you defend terrorist activity? Do you defend violence? And Muri Barghouti said, this is the problem of beginning with secondly. So the line is, if you want to dispossess the people, the simplest way to do it is to tell the story beginning with secondly. So what we're going to hear from Prabir today is more of the firstly, but also uh, he will, uh, I think, speak about some of these shifts that have taken place since October 7th. Some of them that I, uh, that I have noted are, uh, one is of course that now, the entire world globally sees the terrorist state Israel for what it is. It's no longer a secret, it's no longer hidden from anybody. And uh, only, you will notice that only states and governments dis defend Israel, people don't. They just don't. All over the world, people are on the roads and many are actually risking, you know, arrest and so on. And they condemn their governments for this support. Two, we see the shift that the Indian government has made. So uh, there's an old history of solidarity with Palestine. We have a beautiful stamp that was issued by the government of India in solidarity with the Palestinian people. This was in 80s, I think. Uh, uh, but uh, what we now see is that the government continues to hold the official position that India supports Palestine, but also officially uh, helps out Israel by sending um, labor, Indian labor there, uh, to replace Palestinian labor. That's why Indian labor is going there, because genocide means you lose labor as well. So somewhere one really wonders how does any government justify the existence of a class of people who are so desperate in their own country under that government that they have no means of livelihood, no employment, and they prefer to go into the jaws of war. And the government of their country, their own government, expedites this. Think about the ugliness of this uh, and how desperate these people are and how beyond conscience this government is. Um, the third shift that I see is the role of the global media, which uh, is mostly performing the function of disseminating Zionist propaganda. Um, there's the role of the West Asian countries. Uh, and uh, I, you know, one read recently of UAE deporting, promptly deporting a student uh, who uh, shouted free Palestine at his graduation uh, ceremony. So what is the role of the West Asian countries? And this, this, the, the, um, duplicity of the Indian government in maintaining officially that it's pro-Palestine has to also do with keeping West Asian countries on their side because West Asia is good for Indian investors and Indian labor. But at the same time, 
Zionism and Hindutva share too much not to be best friends. They are literally BFF. Uh, and uh, so this kind of, uh, this, this way in which a Zionist Hindutva alliance uh, carries on, on the one hand, Israel is the second top seller of arms to India. It's all a very, very nice little uh, situation. Uh, so, uh, and, and I guess finally, if possible, we could, we should be thinking about uh, and discussing what are the ways in which, what are the long-term solutions, because this will end. This will end. The genocide will end. Israel will be defeated. Because one thing the Palestinians have taught us is this word, sumud. I learned it from Palestine. Sumud. Sumud is determination. It's just, we are here. We will not move. You cannot annihilate every last one of us. That sumud will make sure that this genocide will end. And then what? So maybe these are some of the questions that um, Prabhu would also like to address. And he will address many other things. So Prabhu. I think I was willing to hear the visitor for much more because then it would have reduced my labor. But since you handed over the baton, so to say, to me, I will start with what you have described as the determination of the Palestinian people, particularly in contrast to what happened in 1948. And I remember I had gone to Palestine to one of the what they call villages, which are not villages in our sense of the term. And there was a lady who had lost her husband and she was the head of the village that she had been elected to a position. And she was saying, you know, in 48, we made a mistake. We left our homes thinking we will go back. This was something temporary. We are not going to do this again. We are never, never going to leave our land. So this is what really Zionism is against. How to get rid of the Palestinians so that they can build an ethnically, quote unquote, pure Jewish state. And that is the project which started long back, which now is, as the Vedita has said, in its final throes that they are at the moment isolated from the mass of the public opinion in any place in the world, particularly what would be called the ex-colonial countries. The only support they really had is from what I would call settler colonial states, where those who have done ethnic cleansing don't think this is a big deal. That throwing people out, and I heard this a number of times, it's even heard in India also, that, you know, it's one country, there are 34 or something number of Muslim countries. Why can't they take this few Palestinians there? The problem is over. The Jews are asking for only one state. So this is the argument, which is the argument to come back to it. It's really the argument of settler colonials, that you can get the land free of the people. Of course, genocide is how it happens. And then the land becomes ours by the right of possession. Now, this is what is the basic position that the Europeans and the Americans, the United States, created with 1948. They decided that since the Jews had been massacred for Europe, they needed a homeland. And obviously the homeland could not be in Europe. That was not okay. So the homeland should be somewhere else. And you know, we can say because there is already a Zionist movement to build the homeland in Palestine, we get rid of some of the Arabs and then these can take over that land. And that was the genesis of what 1948 was really all about. Of course, there was the other hidden and not so hidden agenda that we can use the Jewish population, the settler population over there who will be totally dependent on us then to control the Arabs and control the oil of the region. Don't forget, by the time the British and the French, the Europeans and the Americans 
understand that oil is a strategic resource. President Carter later declared that essentially West Asian oil belongs essentially to the United States. That was the strategic declaration he made that this is a strategic resource, resource for us. So we used to have a cartoon which I can't find on the internet that the Americans saying our oil is under their soil, under their sand. So this is the picture, the strategic picture, the importance of oil to the world that was going to emerge post the Second World War, what is what became later the US Imperium, that, that oil was a strategic resource which they would control and the genre arm for that would be the new Zionist state of Israel. And the Palestinian problem was thought to be a minor one. Okay, we need some trouble to get them vacated and then it will be a Jewish state. Now, the issue for me is also, and I'm really going back a little to the past, but how does this vision emerge that you could cleanse a people from one part of the land and say this belongs to somebody else now? And, you know, for us, it seems something which is, we would not think it's possible for us to think that way, that we can be thrown out of one part of our land and this will belong to somebody else. If this was so, the whole national liberation struggles would not have come up. So why was it something which is so easy to formulate is something you need to go back to the psyche of the Europeans and the settler colonial states. By the Europeans, I really mean West European countries, which were the major colonial empires in the world whether it starts with the Spanish and the Portuguese, later the British and the French, to some extent the less efficient Italians who tried this in North Africa, but also parts of West Asia. Uh, if you take all of this, the vision that is there for them is that killing people from the land is okay. This is what ultimately happened in the Americas, Australia and New Zealand as well. Of course, the numbers are much larger than in the, in the Americas than it is in uh, Australia and New Zealand. The interesting part is when you look at that history of ethnic or genocide in the Americas, you find almost invariably the historical reference is given that it happened because disease wiped them out. Diseases of the old world went to the new world and they had no protection against that. And that is why it is not because what they did, but because they had no defense. They had no immunity against these old world diseases. That is why they got wiped out. Now, you know, if you think for about one minute, not what is written, but think about it. Our children get born, babies get born, they have no immunity when they have a little bit of mother's immunity, but that's it. Their immune system develops and it takes a few years for them to get rid of all the small little infections they get as children. And we know that, you know, uh, before vaccination, all some of them were very dangerous infections. Now with all the vaccinations that we do for our children, relatively much less. But you generate within 10, 15, 20 years immunity as a community for any new disease. So why is this historical lie told by serious eminent historians? Because they, can, they have taken it for granted. That's what they learned in school and that's what they've written. But they haven't critically examined, is it correct? And the answer is actually there in research which has been done, which is widely available, that it was not diseases that killed them. What happened is their land was taken away. Their mode of subsistence was destroyed. Those who were actually surviving on bison hunting, that was called, that was systematically stopped. 
not by pushing them out, by killing all the bison so that their food would be denied to them. It's a set of genocidal moves that were made to systematically deprive them of what the system of food production was, depriving them of their lands, pushing them out deeper into systems of forests, other places which they were not used to. And that is what kills them. It is not infection, but infections coupled with starvation, with essentially diseases which thrive then on the weakness of the people. They don't, they don't have enough food. Now, this has been documented very well, much more in the United States, because this country continued for more than 150, 200 years. It didn't happen in a day. It really continued over a period of time. Now, that kind of ethnic cleansing, which they did, quote unquote ethnic cleansing, genocidal violence they did, also bred later the eugenic movement, they're inferior. There are a whole bunch of people who are inferior, so it's all right to kill them, of which, of course, the Germans, Nazi gas chambers were the final result. But that ideology was shared by the British. Eugenics started in Britain, United States, the 1923 immigration law, if I'm not mistaken, 2324 immigration law, which actually specified quotas for different communities. Jews were also not included. Chinese were thrown out, Indians also, but Jews also. And in fact, when the Jews wanted to migrate to the United States, post-Germany, what was happening, they were not allowed. A lot of them were not allowed. In fact, Einstein, etc., are of course allowed, because it is very useful to have scientists over there. But others are not allowed because of the immigration quotas. So this kind of genocidal vision thinks it's all right. We couldn't really make them equal over here. We killed a lot of them. Programs have been there for donkey's years over here. So we need to find a place for them. And the Balfour Declaration was really <coughs> something was seen to be a solution that we can settle the Jews into Palestine. And the Arab problem is a minor, we'll solve it. And that's where they have come up against what is the determination of the Palestinian people that they are not going to leave their land. The second part of what has happened over the Hamas resistance, attack, whatever you want to call it. And let's face it, Hamas was initially seen by Israel as a division and the Palestinians and they were happy about it. So now, of course, the things have turned. And it turned because the Palestinian leadership, post the fall of Soviet Union, decided that they needed to compromise. There was no other way. And they compromised under American tutelage, so to say. And you had the 1993 Accord, which promised them a homeland, that they will get independent Palestinian state within five years. If you see in 1993, the Oslo Accord says within five years they will be, they will get power till then they let it self government. How many years? 1993? You can count seven plus 24, 31 years. Just now, Knesset has passed a resolution that Palestinians are never going to get a Palestinian state. That has been reiterated, which of course is something that was entered in 1993 itself, in bad faith. They knew they were not going to give Palestinian state. And it was, what shall I say, engineered by the Americans. The United States is the one who say, we are there. We are honest brokers. We will see that the Oslo Accords are, will be honored by Israel. And finally, they are not. And even today, as Nivedita was saying, the United States remains as the major backer in the world of the Zionist state of Israel. So this is the background of what I think we need to understand, that this is not just an aberration. It is something very deeply rooted in the colonial history in which genocidal violence has always been an instrument. 
And I think that is why the United States, there is really no major political party today willing to stand up and say this is wrong. There are figures in that who could be saying it, but no major political party, and of course there are only two, they agree on the basic framing of genocide, Zionist violence being okay. This is the basic framework within which they are operating. One can argue that this is something because of the Jewish money, Jewish influence and so on. But it's really not that. Israel was created as an instrument of trying to control West Asia. And that still remains a part of the strategic vision, particularly of the United States and of course the larger interest of NATO. And this is the vision of colonial, ex-colonial and central colonial states. And that is that vision which is today colliding with reality that major parts of the world are not willing to accept. it. Even in India, Modi has the problem that if he kowtows completely to what the United States is saying, then he has a problem because he has also found that they would sell arms, but they don't give you the ability to develop arms. They sell you the French, in this case, the Rafale plane, but nothing happens after that. So his army and his air force is telling him, we need Russian arms because they give not only the arms, they're also willing to part technology. We can even manufacture them and it costs us much less. So if you want to compete with China, which of course he militarily does want to compete with, then we can't alienate Russia as well. Because if we go to the United States, we will neither get technology nor will we really get what we need unless you are willing to bankrupt ourselves. And that is the hard economic logic they now have, that they need to also keep Russia as a partner in some sense. Oil was cheap arms are there. So if they want to have a quasi-independent foreign policy, not as a vassal, but as a quasi-independent foreign policy, they have to come to terms with what where the world is going. And in that, it is very clear that the global south, as we would term it, global south is becoming more and more important. Why is it but becoming more important? Just look at the GDP, the economic figures, and you will find that in the economic figures, it's very clear that the GDP of the world, taken in what is called per capita purchasing power parity terms, that means you have not what is the exchange rate between the dollar and the rupee, but what does a rupee buy in India? What does a dollar buy in the United States? If you take purchasing power parity as a basis, then already the G7, which is, what is it, created the rule-based international order, its GDP today is less than that of the BRICS, the BRICS 5, and it's G7. So already in purchasing power parity, we, the, what would be called earlier, we would have called a third world, but Russia is also there, so it's not really a third world country. But if you take all of this into account, let's face it, China, India's GDP are going to be more and more important in the world. So if you take that into account, it's already true that apart from the United States, which is still a big economy, the ex-colonial powers today are becoming economically less and less important. Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, of course, East Asia and South Asia, all of them are going to be more and more important. So the kind of vision that emerged with the end of the Second World War, and particularly after the fall of Soviet Union, is no longer going to work. And this is what is the Israel problem. That with United States backing, they thought they could rule over West Asia. The NATO powers thought Israel becoming the preeminent military power in the region, they would then be able to control West Asia. 
They had Saudi Arabia as a vassal, almost a vassal state. They had also destroyed Iraq, which had challenged the United States in some way. They had also destroyed Gaddafi and uh, Libya. So they thought that now this is something we should be able to control. But two things have really happened. One is simply technological. That is, it is possible to fight a much bigger military power with relatively less cost. And where do we find this? We find, for instance, I'll take the biggest example of that, Iran versus the United States. The fact that the United States today is vulnerable against Iran attacks. Where do we see this? That when there is a tension, the Seventh Fleet, which is there in, in West Asian waters, to essentially project American power is asked to go towards Australia. Because if you Iran attacks, the advantage that they have is that ballistic missiles, missiles today cost much less and they can attack big aircraft carriers and even possibly sink them, not with too much trouble, not with too much cost. And the worst example for the United States today, as well as NATO, is the Houthis. The Houthis have disrupted the traffic which goes to Suez Canal, picked out various vessels. But the problem is for the world, and it also affects us in some way, because cost of shipping goes is much higher. But the biggest problem that is there is that in spite of the NATO, United States having aircraft carriers, ships over there, they are not able to control their attacks. So this means that a small country, relatively small country with a small economy, can also make it difficult for big powers to project what they used to do earlier. Essentially, that you could send the aircraft carrier and threaten the entire number of states in that region and they would somehow then bend before you. Remember when we had the India, Pakistan, Bangladesh war essentially. At that time the seventh fleet was proceeding towards India. And for those of us who remember, every day front page used to be where is the seventh fleet. So that kind of scenario no longer threatens even a small power like the Houthis in Yemen. So this is one part of what has happened and that also explains what is happening between the Hamas and Israel controlling Gaza, which is a small, really a small part of the land. I mean, if you take the size of Hamas, I mean, uh, Gaza, it's much smaller than Delhi. So if you take that part, that small part, in spite of all the weapons they have used, then I think 80% of Gaza's buildings are not standing anymore. They have imposed starvation at a level where more than 90% are in, are in danger of starvation. And acute starvation has affected probably about 15% of the population. And don't forget, it affects the children, the babies much more than it affects other people. So this is what they, had, they have done. The Lancet paper said 186,000 killed, where 36, 37,000 was the official figures. And as we know that the Israeli authorities also agree that what the Gaza authorities have been saying are correct. That these are figures which are correct. Again, publicly it's known. Unfortunately for Israel, this information are no longer secret. It leaks and it comes out in the world. So this is more or less verified and it doesn't take into account the missing, which is what the Lancet figures are, that people who are under the debris, that those bodies are not recovered. So all said the numbers, the, the figures of act and the figures that of Palestinian Authority, the Hamas actually in Gaza are putting out are figures of actual verified deaths. They have seen the body, they know the person is dead, they have identified 
These are the figures they put. They have not counted people who they know, don't know whether they're dead or not. So the Lancet figure saying 186,000 is probably a more realistic figure that we have seen. So in spite of all of this, starvation, babies dying, it, those pictures are impossible to see. And all of that violence, you still have the United States support Israel. Not only politically, but through arms and money. You have the Europeans taking a position. You know what they're doing is not correct, but. So the but becomes the signal for what they can still do. And at the end of it, what is going to happen is really the future of it lies in the Zionist state of Israel. And I think there is an important element here for us to think about that the Zionist state of Israel is also facing a crisis. It's a crisis not of legitimacy. It never was legitimate in the eyes of most of the world. Most of the world which today is politically has more ability even if it doesn't assert it. But what was that Israel state which was created in 1948, it actually was essentially an ethnically a Zionist state. It was ethnic nationalism. It thought there were Jews. What kind of Jews is immaterial? As we know, all identities are ultimately artificially created. So they had a Zionist identity, but they considered themselves relatively secular. So the ethnic state of Israel is what they were creating. They were not creating a religious state of Israel. So Palestinians are ethnically Palestinians. They are ethnically Jews. Religion is there amongst a certain section. And today what is being contested in Israel is this ethnic nationalism versus what is the religious identity based nationalism. And that's a very... It's an interesting issue that is really also much more concentrated in the West Bank, where in the settler colonial portions, territories have come up in the last, uh, particularly post the Oslo Accord. So that, that, that section is more religiously identifies itself with uh, Jewish religion. It also, the, the most extreme sections, apart from being very extreme, is also that they don't believe they should come and fight. They would only do religious studies and they don't want to be drafted into the army. While the secular Jews are willing to fight in the army. They're ethnic nationalists, but they're, they do service. Military service, the religious Jews don't want to do. But they are the ones who are today driving the politics of Israel. And this division is also going deep inside the Israeli state that you have this which side is going to win. And there is a slow move now to migrate out of Israel. And it's already, I think, in the last uh, few years, half a billion have left Israel. And there is a recent sample survey indicated 25% of the Jews out of Israel now want to migrate out of this state. So the stake, the unity with which the state of Israel or the Jewish population of Israel was willing to fight is now getting, the crisis they are in is also splintering. The United States and the ex-colonials grip over West Asia is weakening in spite of the fact that you have sultans and kings and uh, so on over there, even they have to listen to what the Western papers call as the Arab streets. You know, Arabs are only there in the streets. It's not an Arab population, according to the, the Western media. So the Arab streets are not happy if you go with Israel. So the kings and various other powers who wanted to make nice with the Israeli state are now facing a crisis that if they push their people too far, they might lose their crown or their throne. So this threat is also there. And that is what is also making 
a lot of them take pops. The ones who are bordering Israel doesn't, like Jordan. Jordan is very much, the king of Jordan is very much in their pockets. He has not shown any spine whatsoever in spite of what is happening. But across West, West Asia now, including Saudi Arabia, the way they were making up to Israel after what is called the Abraham Accords today is weakening. And you find they really don't want to identify themselves with the sinking ship they think of Israel. Now, does it mean that Israel will sink over the next few years? No. We must also take, also address the fact that Israel's, if it does go the way it is going, if it is on the path of destruction, that destruction could be also extremely violent and it can also take a huge toll. Because let's face it, Zion, the state of Israel possesses nuclear weapons. And will they use it or will they not? That's a question which is unanswered. If there is a war against Israel by Arab states, yes. Question is, will they use it against Iran and will it, they use it preemptively? These are questions which we cannot really answer because they also know that if there is a war with Iran, that Israel, the way they have fought other wars is not going to happen. Simply because the amount of rockets and other missiles that is there, you can take out the fertilizer plant, the chemical plants, the Dimona nuclear plant and so on. So that was a state in which there was a kind of armed, I won't say truce, but at least armed peace, which was always on the edge, but not really spilling over into war. Can it happen? A war can it, is it like? We don't know. Are they likely to attack Hezbollah, which has the rocketry and the missiles to possibly strike deep within Israel? We don't know. So we are at a very difficult point in the world in which the Palestinian cause is also merging into the larger crisis of West Asia, a combination of neocolonialism with essentially medieval kings and so on. That is one explosion which, is, which can go in any direction. So what is it that we can do? What is it the rest of the world can do? I think what we have been doing, but we need to do it much more strongly, that A, raise our voices against what is happening in Palestine. It's not an issue of Palestine. It's an issue of neocolonialism. It's an issue which can take the whole of West Asia down with it. It can take our energy security for all of us. Energy security is at risk. This one part of the world going down in any major war in the current interconnected globe is a danger for every country. How do we now bring this and put this on the international arena is the challenge before us. Therefore, it is not only for our solidarity for the Palestinian cause, but is also solidarity for what happens to all of us if this war spins out of control. I think this is a selfish, if you will, also vision should ask us to be much more active on this and press upon our government, which wants to still maintain a uh, precarious equidistance, their heart is with Israel, but their economy is too dependent on West Asia and the military is too dependent on Russia to also take a position where their heart is. So this is where we also have to fight both internally against what is, what, what shall I say, the weaknesses, if I may put it very softly, the weaknesses of this government's policies, but also the voice of solidarity to be raised in every part of the globe that this battle should not continue. And therefore, the world has to address what has happened to the Palestinians, not only for the Palestinian cause, but even in their selfish interests. So these are the things that I think I would like to put on the table. Lastly, Unfortunately, when 
imperialist major imperialist power spawn you get quite often barbarism that takes over so the question before us is in the fall of the american imperium are we going to face in the world a longer period of barbarism or will it will it not happen that way and if you see what is happening in the united states you somehow feel that barbarism is really where it will go at least for the united states this is what i tend to see in the choices before them are these two old men i'm sorry i won't say equally old okay <laughs> I think Trump is slightly younger than younger than me. So, <laughs> but if that is the future that they have, then we as the world also have a bleak future because, unfortunately, the death throes of imperialism are never going to be peaceful for the rest of us. But we have to struggle. We have to fight. We have to raise our voices. and we have built, we have to build solidarity with the palestinian cause and this is not simply because what's happening to them is what we need to condemn but also because it's intrinsically linked to other struggles in the rest of the world and i think that is very important for us to understand that the struggle against imperialist forces against ex colonial forces which even in their death throes have destructive potential and this is why we need to build the largest solidarity we can in the world today i'm going to end here i think i've spoken more than what my quota was mm-hmm. but i'm going to stop now yeah thanks pravee uh, um before we open up uh, for q and a um i was wondering if you could just uh have a uh, what are your views on what are the possible solutions in the sense that uh they we used we used to hear about one state solution two state solution so someone like chomsky for example as far as i know well right now he's very ill but as far as i know he did uh, take the position still uh, of a two state solution that is palestine and two independent states of palestine and israel but increasingly i think uh, several voices from within the palestinian resistance but also anti zionist israelis like ilan pape uh, are pointing out that that's not a viable situation anymore because israel's policies have completely taken over palestine so that there are no two states now possible so they um, uh, pape and others have been advocating as you know the binational one state uh with equal rights for both citizens israelis and with the right of return so that's a very important the right of return of palestinians who have left uh so i find this idea of a binational state very interesting because you if you think of the history of the nation state it's fairly recent uh but we've always assumed that nation states and states are nation states um uh, but in 2009 bolivia declared itself to be a plurinational state uh chile it with its new constitution which has been uh, rejected but it was trying for some kind of plurinationalism a plurinational kind of uh, state so a binational state uh, is this is this possible i imagine something like post apartheid in south africa which was also settler colonialism uh and they had a very painful history to come to terms with truth and reconciliation etc but they're struggling but uh, they're not struggling because they're struggling because of other reasons not because of the nature of the uh, the way in which rights of citizens are defined so i was just wondering have you thought about what what is the future for in, in when when the genocide ends well you know first is this nation states which are homogeneous which are based on language this is something which started really long before that such concept did not arise they were really kingdoms and as anderson wrote 
it was really the result of the printing press. Mm -hmm. Effectively, mm -hmm. that was the argument. Well, let's put it this way: that Germany and France put two fought two world wars just on that. Mm -hmm. Alsace Lorraine, is it France or is it Germany? Because the population was 50 50 over there. Now, the problem that we have that after, say, 1947 in India, or after the colonial era slowly comes to an end, if we want to use the same principles of the which, of which the European nation states come into existence, then of course we are looking at destruction of all the kingdoms, all the states. Because it's no longer viable. Look at Africa. Africa is not ethnically created by ethnic nationalities. It's created sitting in Vienna, something 1870 or something like that. They on the map draw lines and decide this is France, this is England, this is Germany, this is Portugal, this is Spain, and so on. And of course, it had no ethnic nationality, uh, linguistic nationality. All of these were not considered. And if you take the Arab world, for instance, again, they speak the same language, but they're different states. And if you dig deep, they are culturally, they have similarities and dissimilarities. As one of my Palestinian friends said, you know, I have nothing in common with the desert Arabs. Okay. <laughs> now, they speak the same language. They can understand each other. The Egyptians and the you know, North, uh, North African Arab states don't really understand the Egyptian Arabic properly. But nevertheless, in spite of all of this, same language, you don't think that there's a common Arab state possible. So this is, I think, something we have to take into cognizance that most post-colonial states have been created on the basis of the struggle against colonial masters. That is where the concept of the nation state has arisen in the quote unquote third world countries. And question of linguistic ethnic nationalism, if we open that in the third world, the post-colonial world, then we do not have the possibility of surviving various nuclear holocausts that will result from it. So I think that's a closed path. What will happen between the artificially created Jewish state, which was which is what Israel is, is something which finally will depend how the Jewish population over there is going to face up to the fact they have to coexist with, co with Palestinians because their ability to exterminate the Palestinians is not there. Their ability to think they can actually get rid of the Palestinians, which is what they dearly want, is not there. And they are embedded in a part of the world which has no contiguity with Europe, which is what their actual heritage is. If you take the Ashkenazi Jews, not the people who came from other parts of the world, the more uh, Asian uh, or African or uh, Arab, Jew, Arab Jewish, Jews who lived in the Arab world. If you take that section out, most of them are Ashkenazi Jews. They also think they are secular, whatever their secularism is. And they are the ones who have the option to go to back to Europe. And according to a recent census, 25% of the Jewish population of Israel now wants to leave Israel. So either they face up to the fact that they have to coexist with Palestinians or over the next 40, 50 years, most of them will leave Israel if this path continues. The question which I posed is, is it possible for them to apply, what is it called, the Samsung option? Samsung option being pull down Israel before you leave, drop a few nuclear bombs here and there, and the whole that part of the world gets destroyed. That's a good question. Because let's face it, there is nothing stopping people for, from being stupid. And <laughs> therefore, stupidity for the Israeli population is, I think, the biggest threat to all of us. So I would think the 
monolithic European nationalism still takes for its basis the concept of a nation which is ethnically or linguistically homogeneous and then you talk about a binational state. Mm. But I think that is the problem, mm. that itself is for me the problem. Because you can think of, say, Palestinians saying we are Christians, we are Muslims. And we have two states now. Are they also to become binational Palestinians? Mm. Are they Arabs? Mm. Should there be one common Arab state, which was originally thought of? Mm. So all of these questions, I think, is now to be thought of independent of the framing of European nationalism. Mm and accepting that that homogeneous nation state is no longer something the world can actually bear. That that is a closed path. Whatever we have got, we have to live together and we have to live with each other. And that is something which you have to learn in India too. At the moment, I think that's the biggest problem that we have.